okay, if you can't get the privilege and you can't get the money and you don't have the family, how do you build the relationship with the right people? And that's the question people should be asking instead of shutting their mind off. Welcome to Teach Me Real Estate Investing, a show where I share my personal journey and the challenges I face as an investor. I invite industry experts to share their wisdom and advice to help me overcome these adversities with the hopes that it'll help you on your own personal journey. I'm your host, Sawad Ghimire, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode. Today we're going to be speaking with Cody Davis and we're really going to dive into creative financing and how he got started in real estate uh, with little to no money. Uh, so Cody, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you having me. Thanks yeah. for uh, putting this yeah. together. Yeah, I'm pumped to talk to you this morning. Um, so I got started in real estate beginning of 2022. And uh, that's about when I started listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast. And you were one of the first episodes I listened to. And so hearing your story, it totally oh, cool. blew my mind. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful if, you know, for folks that don't know you, don't know your story, maybe we could get started and you could tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started in real estate and where you are currently in your real estate investing journey. Yeah, so I'm 23 today. I got started at 19 years old as a real estate agent. I wasn't a very good one either. <laughs> I had no clients, but some guy on the internet told me that I could make a ton of money as a real estate agent. So I ended up dropping out of college. I was going to Tacoma Community College at the time. Originally, I was supposed to go to, uh, there, there was a prestigious school, uh, school UPS, University of Puget Sounds in the greater Seattle area and uh, wanted to go for chiropractics and, mm -hmm. and PT. And I thought that was going to be the thing for me. Ended up going to community college and then um, got this DM from a guy on Facebook. And he said, you could probably make more money as a real estate agent than anything you're pursuing. So here I was thinking I was going to make the big bucks and I left school, got my license and uh yeah the, the rest has been history i spent nine months i sold two deals and um shortly after that it was a mobile home and a duplex mm -hmm. i ended up buying a 12 unit apartment building it was listed on the mls first person in my family tree to ever buy anything other than a house and um, over the past three and a half years bought 110 rental apartments and a resort Wow, that's incredible. And at the age of 23, right? I think you're making the rest of us <laughs> look bad here. But uh, I think there's a lot there that uh, I think we can dive into. So tell us a little bit more about this guy on the internet that just DM'd you and said, hey, you can make a lot of money. Like, what? Tell us a little bit more about that. And what made you just trust that and, you know, pull the trigger? Because, you know, there are a lot of sketchy people on the internet. Yeah, something that I've learned, I didn't know this when I got started, is that not everybody tells you the truth. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm i a very open person, but I'm also a very trusting person. Right. And so I thought I, I thought he was telling me the truth. And he was partially telling me the truth. There was an opportunity to make a lot of money, but right. the problem was I had no family in the business. Mm -hmm. I had no friends in the business. I had no clients. I was a college dropout, so I hadn't showed anybody I could commit to anything. And I didn't think these things through. Right. Logically. Today, I think through things logically. Back then, I didn't. And so I just trusted that it was going to work. And it didn't. The, the fact that I bought real estate, I'm super stoked about, but that's not just because I had my license. He... Uh, the, the way that I got connected with this guy, he did send me a DM, but the way that that all came about is I was doing some cleaning at um, a friend of my dad, one of their houses. It was one of my um, dad's friend's houses, and I, I was cleaning, and I ended up meeting their handyman, and he talked about wanting to do flips, and mm -hmm. they uh, they said, uh, you should do uh, you should join this real estate group, a, fa a Facebook group, and so I made a little post, and I actually saved the post because... That was like at the very end of 2018, right before I turned 19 years old. Okay. And it said, I want to get into multiple jobs. I was coaching gymnastics at the time. I had just applied to Target. I had just applied to Safeway. I actually worked like, I think it was like five or 10 minutes at Safeway before mm -hmm. I quit that. 
Uh, but I, I was working multiple jobs and just trying to save money. And the, the goal is to buy a duplex. And that, that's where the guy reached out and said, hey, you should, you should just get your real estate license. You'll make more money. Yeah. Um, at 18, in your mind, you your goal was to buy a duplex, right? That's I think that's a lot further than most 18-year-olds. How did you get into that mindset of and that goal of, hey, yeah. I want to save up money for a duplex? Yeah, so it, we have to go way back in time at that point. So I, I was probably 13, 14. And I talked a little bit about this in the Bigger Pockets podcast, but um, someone that my mom had been seeing at the time when I was a kid, gave me a book and it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. And so I picked it up and I was just a youngster. I read it. It was an easy book to read. Right. Right? And I'm not a reader. I don't like to read. But um, I read the book and I got super stoked about the idea of rental property. Right. It was the idea that, huh, I, I love cars. So the idea of I don't have to pay for the car if I get something else to pay for it right. or someone else to pay for it, that was really cool for me. And then I realized I was you know, a teenager mm -hmm. or a young one at that. I couldn't have a job. So I put the book back down and ended up picking it back up in high school because I had a teacher who was, he was my civics teacher. And um, well, he was also an attorney. And he said, if you come to the last day of school, teach you how to make money when you sleep. And I was like, that sounds like fun. And yeah. he talked about how he bought his little house in Tacoma for like 5,000 bucks mm -hmm. for sale by owner way back when. And all my buddies said, oh, can't do that anymore. But I reread uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Right. And still had the, the book at home. It was just collecting dust on the shelf. And that sparked interest. Right. But I didn't really do anything about that because then I graduated high school. I started doing my first few quarters at college. And then when I had uh, ended up helping cleaning at my dad's friend's house and met the met his contractor handyman guy. And then I got invited to the Facebook group, made that post, and then I, I left college. But that that's how I got into that mindset. It was yeah. just a very long period of time. Nothing really happened in there. And it was just a fluke that I was given the book because it wasn't someone who's related to me. It was just someone who was um, friends of my mom. Right. Um, so you quit. You became a real estate agent. You said, you know, it was tough for you. And then you ended up buying a 12 unit apartment building. Right. So take us through that yeah. journey. Like, how did you end up, I guess, was it a shift in priorities and goals or like, how did you end up in this 12 unit apartment deal? Yeah. So that, that was fun. That, that was very exciting time. Yeah. That the acceleration is what's really the rush is yeah. it feels great. Not just going fast, but, yeah. uh, so that deal popped up. That was not the first deal I looked at. The very first deal I looked at was 22 units mm -hmm. and I didn't know what was going on back then because I didn't know how real estate worked. I was an agent, but most agents don't know anything. And that's just a fact. <laughs> they don't know how they understand what has to happen, but they don't understand how it all works together. And I did, I definitely didn't understand it. Right. Back then I had, there was another agent in the office and I liked that guy a lot. I mean, he, he was like a pivotal person for me just he knows everything about everything it was it was incredible but he, he was farther in his career he was probably three times my age at the time and um he had this client and this client was under contract on a 22 unit over in a little place called moses lake now i'm actually in moses lake right now i'm in a hotel but uh i'd never heard of moses lake before it's 22 units in the breakdown it had a fourplex a sixplex and a twelveplex Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward, I've since bought the six and the 12 plex out of that portfolio. So you can, you can see that that one client didn't get it, but the client didn't have the funds. It was seller finance. It was a million for purchase and it was 300,000 down. It was an incredible deal. Uh, really good cash flow day one with huge upside in it. Like you just couldn't find this deal. It was off market. I mean, it, it was hard to put together. Uh, but I didn't put it together. This other agent did. And his client ended up not having the funds, backing out. He was going to borrow the down payment. These are all things I didn't know about. I didn't know mm -hmm. about seller financing. I didn't know you could borrow down payments. I didn't really understand how the, the purchasing process worked. But when he backed out, 
um, that original guy who DM'd me had a private money fund and the fund was, was out of money. Like it, it was tapped. I didn't know that at the time, but it didn't have like a ton of extra money. But the way that it worked is the guy who was running it, he had real estate clients and then other agents in the office had real estate clients. And whenever there was, it was called a private placement. Whenever there was a time where they needed a loan, they would just pitch clients and get the money. So that's what they were going to do for this guy. And they were going to try and get a $300,000 second lien. Mm -hmm. And they didn't end up want to fund it for this guy. It just, it seemed like he didn't want to do any work. He just wanted to slum it, collect checks. That was my perspective on the whole situation anyway, as a 19 year old. And so he, they didn't extend financing for the down payment. What ended up happening was the guy who DM'd me, he's like, you know what, this could be a cool story. Cause I had been working with him for like, it'd been probably seven or eight months at the time right. that I had been there. He's like, this would be a cool story if a 22 year old, or as a, sorry, I'm thinking about today, <laughs> if a 19 year old did it. And um, so he was like, what if we just funded it for you? Mm -hmm. And it was going to cash flow five grand a month. Yeah. Day one. And I was thinking 19 years old, five grand a month net cash flow. I don't have to do anything. I was thinking I would hit the lottery. Well, we needed a one week extension to get the financing in place. They were just going to line up for me. I wasn't going to do any of the work. I was going to be one of those lucky kids. Right. The right place, right time. That didn't come together. The seller didn't give the extension and uh, I lost that deal. But this is the first time I heard about seller financing. It was also the first time I, I heard that you could borrow the down payment. I thought I was going to get lucky just hit it big, huge upside, huge cash flow, and be good. Five grand a month was good for me at 19. <laughs> right. So it so didn't come together. I had to do my research because I still wanted to do that. That was what flipped the switch. It's like, I don't need money to buy stuff. Yeah. And so I looked on the MLS and I, I was complaining to everybody in the office. I was like, oh, this was going to be great. I was like, yeah, kid, whatever. That's what I, basically people said. But I said, I'm going to try and find something. So I looked up seller financing as a key term on the MLS. And found the 12 plex, called them up, asked them how they want it written up. And I got it under contract. And the way it was originally structured, million one twenty five purchase, 15% down, which was like 168,000 bucks. And eventually renegotiated to 10% down. So it was 112,500. It's like a 60 day closing. The difference of this deal was they weren't just going to line up all the money for me. They being the, the people in the office, I had to make the pitches to the, the clients. Yeah. But got under contract, made the pitches. In the meantime, I was reading books like Deals on Wheels by Lonnie Scruggs. Um, Carlton Sheets has an audiobook program, buying real estate, no to low money down. So every time I was driving over to Moses Lake, I was looking at these deals. Uh, like I, I drove the 22 unit portfolio and then I drove the 12 plex. I'd be listening to Carlton Sheets and in the off time, I'd be reading the Deals on Wheels by Lonnie Scruggs book. That was like micro lending, seller finance, mobile homes. And I botched a bunch of pitches and that was like the, that was the whole cycle. I've never actually said all of that before on just one podcast <laughs> and get that on bigger, podcasts. but that's how that whole thing played out. Yeah. No, that that's incredible. And as I said, inspiring. And I'm glad that, you know, we have the whole story on this podcast because I think a lot of people, especially newer folks, they don't really understand what it takes, right, first of all. And then the second piece is that is still possible, right? It, it is hard work, but all of this is possible. And I think that it's, it's really great that you were able to share that story because I think that's what it highlights. It's also possible to get lucky. Like right. you could just fall into the right place. If that 22 unit, if that had happened, mm -hmm. I would have been better off in 19. I think long term, I wouldn't have been better off because that would have been too easy. Right. Uh, it had just if it had just fallen and everyone had done the work for me. So I'm glad it didn't happen that way. But for folks listening, there are situations in life where it could sound too good to be true. Had that happened, that would have been a too good to be true moment. But it still would have worked. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, there's a high level of skepticism on the right the creative finance so that that can only happen through family or that can only happen through close connections. It's like, well, if you don't have the family to do it, you better go build some relationships. So you have close connections with property owners and that I'm sure we'll talk about that more after this, but like, that's how I built the portfolio is yeah. 
building relationships with people. So I have those close connections. Yeah. And I, I think you're getting to this. And I, I, I want to touch on this because a lot of people, I think, when they hear your story of, hey, at 19, he was able to buy an apartment complex. At 22, he has a portfolio of uh, over 100 units, right? It, I think naturally, folks have a lot of skepticism and they think, oh, he must have gotten lucky. Oh, he must be have like rich parents. Oh, he must be privileged, blah, 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 right? Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Like, oh, I think that kind of thinking holds back a lot of people uh, because they make excuses for other people and they say, hey, my situation yeah. is different. I am not able to do this because I don't have blah, blah, blah. I want to hear your thoughts on what you'd say to people like that. Um, yeah, number one, it's not true for my situation. Right. However, that said, for folks who are listening to this, like, oh, easy for you to say, it's like, well, even if it was true, which it's, in my situation, it's not, but I've spent a lot of time learning from people that it also wasn't for them, but I've learned from people that were born into it. Mm -hmm. The difference of my perspective, learning from people that were born into it, is I can still learn from them. Right. Because what did their parents do? Like everybody wants to be able, to, at least what I've found is most people want to be able to pass something onto their kids. Right. Yet as soon as they pass something onto their kids, their kids get, you know, the raw end of the stick because their parents did the right thing. Right. And and so while I wasn't given the the silver spoon of oh here's a whole bunch of real estate here's a whole bunch of money I've never borrowed money from family right to to go do real estate deals. What um, most people do is as soon as they see that that's happened for some people, their brain shuts off and they stop learning. When in reality, if they just learned how those people's parents got to where they're at, not how they got to where they're at. I mean, that's, you have an idea. However, how did their parents do that? You learn that and then you repeat it. Right. But instead, most people say, oh, that's impossible. Couldn't do it in my situation not gonna work for me because i don't have that privilege i don't have that relationship it's like well okay if you can't get the privilege and you can't get the money and you don't have the family how do you build the relationship with the right people right and that's the question people should be asking instead of shutting their mind off because there's been times where i thought well like i can't do that mm -hmm. i've looked at people that have two thousand units in their 30s right without syndicating I'm like I can't get there. Right. And then I, I take a step back. I'm like, well, how the heck did they do it? Right. And so I'm looking at flying out to Texas in two days because I, I heard of a guy that owns it's like 3,000 units with just a couple partners without syndicating. And I heard there's an opportunity to grab lunch. Yeah. Now, some people would say, well, I can never get there. So there's no reason. But if you could just learn how they got to their first 100, 100 is life changing. Right. 15 is life changing. So I'd say people need a, a perspective shift. Mm -hmm. They don't have to change everything, but if you can change the quality of your questions, then the quality of your outcome typically is also going to shift. Yeah, that's awesome. If you were to pick one factor that you think led to your success today, what would you contribute that one factor to? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I ask a lot of questions. Okay. And I, beyond just asking the questions, the, the big thing is I want to understand why things work the way they do. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to know what has to happen to, to create success, but why does X lead to Y? Right. Like, what, why is it the order that it is? And that's really simplified the game for me. I've been able to keep it really simple. Mm hmm Today, I've got one main business partner and a couple other business partners, but just one main one. I work with Christian. You've probably seen him online yeah. because we do a lot of stuff together. But everything in my universe has been super simple because I understand the steps. And I learned the steps from all these people that I thought were way beyond me. They're just further in their journey. It's not like anybody's better than one another, right. but they, they've done more stuff because they've been doing it for longer. I've just gone out and learned from those folks. And that's really been able to simplify it for me. Keeping things simple and understanding the, the order of operations has, has really been what's done it for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think a lot of investors, especially newer investors such as myself, one of the questions we go through in our mind is, 
there are so many options out there on how to invest in real estate. But I guess yeah. one big question is, hey, should I look at multifamily properties or should I look at single family or, you know, things you can finance uh, with a residential yeah. loan, right? Uh, what made you, I mean, initially your, on your, in your mind, you were thinking, I want to save up for a duplex, but you went for a 12 plex mm -hmm. and you've continued to grow into larger and larger multifamily properties. Uh, was there a reason that you chose multifamily as a way of investing? Or is that just because you ended up in the situation where you were able to, you know, be exposed to multifamily deals and you decided to just go after it? Yeah. I didn't know how to articulate this when I first got started, but your perspective shifts as new opportunities arise. And so that 22 unit, I was looking at duplexes. And I, that was my first thing, because that's what I read in, in Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's like, you just get assets that pay you. And he started with a condo for 18 grand, threw it on a credit card. And it's like, well, maybe I could do a duplex. Yeah, That was the philosophy. But the 22 unit opened up, and it was the, the 4, the 6, and the, the 12 of which since then I bought the six and the 12 plex out of that portfolio. That was years after I first saw it. Um, but the, the perspective changed because instead of looking at a duplex mm -hmm. there, there was 22. It was like, right. this is awesome. It's 11 times bigger. So my thought process was, okay, I, if I could do 22, let's just figure out an opportunity that I could buy. And since then I've quantified it as deal debt equity, you find the deal first, then you locate the debt and then you figure out the down payment, which could be more debt or it could be money down. I didn't know that in the beginning. I didn't know anything in the beginning, mm -hmm. but I looked up seller financing and what popped up was a 12 plex. Right. So that that's how that happened. But looking back, knowing what I know now, I didn't know why it worked the way it did, but I looked it up and I was like, okay, you have a deal. Then you line up the debt, which is what I did, the seller mm -hmm. finance piece. And then I had to figure out the money down. And uh, the 12 plex is what popped up. Had a duplex popped up and I could make it work, totally would have done it. Yeah. But I wanted to buy real estate. It's like when you get in the mode of buying a car. Mm -hmm. As soon as you decide you're buying a car, you're buying a car. Like right. If you think about it, yeah. people typically just figure out a way to do it. Yeah. Uh, so I want to get into creative financing, uh, the way you finance okay. these multifamily deals. Uh, tell us yeah. how you finance that first one. You said seller financing 12 uh, uh, units. Um, did you need a down payment or, or was it 100% seller yeah. financed? No, it definitely wasn't 100%. The, it was originally 85% seller financed, got to a sticking point on terms, renegotiated. The term they wanted is that I could not pay them off literally could not pay them off in the first five years. I was like, mm -hmm. well, what if I have to sell? What, what happens if, if uh, I bought in Quincy? What happens if Quincy blows up? Like, what, if, what do I do? Yeah. So it's like, I'm not going to not say that I can't pay you guys off if I have to sell. So they're like, fine, we'll just do a big prepayment penalty for the first 10 years. So I was like, fine. But I also negotiated to 10% down. Okay. And so 90% seller finance, 10% down. Problem is I didn't have the 112,500 yep. bucks down. I had $3,000, so I was a little bit short. And what ended up happening was I, I had to come up with the money. I had to raise it. So instead of getting handed the money, like I was on my first deal I looked at, which was for another client, which was 300 grand down, my mentor at the time and a broker in the office was like, well, you gotta make the pitches. I'll line up some clients and we'll bring in some other clients from other brokers, but you gotta make the pitch. And so I botched a bunch of those, but mm -hmm. basically the, the, the debt structure that played out I did land one of the pitches. Uh, the seller finance piece was a 30 year fully amortized debt, no balloon, meaning it'll just pay off like a home loan, 6% mm -hmm. interest, which was high for back then. And that's fine. Uh, but that's fixed rate. The 10% down was I borrowed 125 grand to cover closing costs and put a little bit of money in the bank. And that was 12% interest, okay. interest only for one year. Okay. The thought process was I can earn it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't turn it. So I had to beg for an extension. <laughs> I ended up paying another point and extended it for one year and then I paid it off. So I got that knocked out a little over a year ago. Okay. Yeah. So I want to talk about different options, right? So that's how you did your yeah. first deal. You've done several since then. What are some common f uh, creative financing methods uh, that you use in your deal? What are common that are used in the industry? Um, 
Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, as far as putting together deals, if you don't qualify with bank, you're not working with bank. You work with the pieces you got in front of you. So seller financing was the main one for me. Uh, that's a promissory note and a deed of trust. I've also done real estate contracts, which are similar, but in the event of foreclosure, this is more of a comfort feature for sellers. It's not a judicial foreclosure. It doesn't have to go through all the same court proceedings. So some people like to do a real estate contract, but the difference is, at least in the state that I'm in, is one, the prom note and deed of trust creates a lien and the real estate contract doesn't. It's just a contractual obligation. So there's some more creative clauses you can get into with that, but people don't need to know about all the extra clauses to get started in real estate. I mean, the, ma the main thing is to understand that if you want to buy real estate, there, there's a couple of things in play, especially if you want to do the seller finance piece. Most debt products today have a due on sale clause, so you got to pay them off. And under traditional deal structure, even when you're playing creative finance, traditional deal structure out, outside of finance, you have to provide what's called free and clear title. And free and clear title means there's no liens against the asset. Mm -hmm. So if people have debt with the bank and you want to do something like this, the, the standard structure is you have to pay off the down payment or you have to pay off what they owe that with your down payment. And if you can't, then you have to figure out some other product to knock out their debt or assume their debt. And that would be standard best practice. So it's really easy to do this if the seller has no debt, okay. which is why the, the model that I've done and that I encourage people to repeat is to meet with folks who have done exceptionally well in the space. I find everybody I've ever met with on Google Maps, call them up, learn how they got to where they're at over coffee mm -hmm. and learn how they built their portfolio. And that's how I built my strategy. But uh, through that, I met a lot of affluent people right. that I didn't know four years ago. And they've taught me how to play the game. And I learned that they levered up for a long time. Then they paid it all off with the rents. And, and now they're, they're sitting pretty. Yeah. But uh, through those relationships, that's enabled me to do seller financing with low to no money down because they don't have any due on sale clauses. They don't have any debt obligations to pay off. Right. So it's not just direct to people saying, hey, I want to buy your property, but hey, how the heck did you build this portfolio? I've never done that before. Yeah. And now that I built it, I'm, I'm doing exactly what they said. They said, get to X amount of units, start paying down your debts, then develop because that's how you get really rich as you do the development mm -hmm. game and then you pay off all your portfolio and you're just, you're set. But I mean, that's part of the cycle in the beginning. People should just meet with the players to learn how they got to where they're at. And then yeah. you build the relationships with the affluent individuals and, through that process, then you can avoid the whole due on sale clause because a lot of those affluent people pay off their stuff yep. and you can do low to no down self financing. Awesome. Yeah. Let me just reiterate some of that. I think there was a lot of information in there. So uh, the first thing you said is when you're finding a deal, right? There's if the seller who owns the, you know, the uh, property has a loan on that property right they, they financed it through a bank or something it becomes complicated right there it's not a free and clear title because the bank could technically take that back uh if no one's paying the the loan uh, am i understanding that correctly well when the when title conveys standard best practices uh, at least for most mortgage products is you have to pay off any obligations tied to, mm -hmm. to the asset that's that is the norm there are ways to get around that multiple ways to get around that that are legal and that are good uh, but yeah i mean you can also assume the mortgage there's there's real estate contracts so you can keep it in place but best practice is to pay off any liens on title at time of closing so you have free and clear title that conveys Got that it. is the simplest way and that's the only way i recommend people doing business especially when getting started because right. there's no reasons to add steps and add complications i see uh, in those situations, if the person has, you know, pretty large debt on the property, then it becomes difficult for you, right? You have to pay off a pretty large portion of their debt, and then you would, uh, I guess, get the property with a clear title, and then you would have to, um, I guess, finance it your own way. That's 
If you're getting value from this video, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. It'll let YouTube know to put this video in front of more people so that they can also learn something from it. Thank you, and let's get back to the show. Yeah, that's that's one way to do it. Another way, if they own a whole bunch of assets, they can just move the collateral to another asset they own, and then they own that one free and clear. Now, are people going to do that if you don't have a relationship with them? Absolutely not. So you have to build the relationship first, and that's the reason that it's all set up the way it is. I see. Yeah. But the simpler method, it sounds like if, if you can find folks who already have their property owned, free, uh, you know, uh, fully paid off, those deals end up becoming much more simpler, right? Because then the path is just... Absolutely. Simple. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something else Absolutely. in there where you, where you said, I find people through Google Maps or something like that, right? Could you talk a little bit more about that? What you mean by I find people off of Google Maps to talk to? I've talked with some bigger players in the space and they always think I'm joking when I say this, but every property you could ever want to buy is on Google maps. So the thought process is if you're doing the aerial view, you just pick, pick whatever one you want and call it up, call them up and learn how they got to where they're at. There are a lot of identical looking properties on planet earth properties mm -hmm. that are in different locations, but look the same. And so if you figure out how someone bought one of them, right you could repeat it to buy all of them and that was the philosophy that i had and whether it's right or wrong i just look at the map i look for right. big roofs just bigger roofs are more likely to be multifamily than smaller roofs all right just statistically speaking mm -hmm. and um, call them up learn how they they ended up buying it they're usually going to say they're not selling it to which i would just say i don't know how i would buy it yeah, yeah. which is accurate in the beginning and um, that, but that is how I do it. I just figure out who owns it, who owns the big roof. How do I call them up? I got to figure out who the owner is. Now I have to get good at finding people's phone numbers. And there was just a process. And we put the whole process on Christian on my YouTube channel because so many people had questions on it. But in 10 minutes, you can find anybody's phone number. I've done this for, uh, you can do this for Wolf of Wall Street, the Cardones, the Kiyosakis. Oh. You can do it for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so one way you find your deals is you said you went to the MS MLS and just searched seller financing. <laughs> I typically don't yeah. see a lot of, maybe I'm mistaken, but not a lot of, uh, when I go to websites like Redfin, for example, I don't see a lot of uh, apartment buildings, right? Commercial real estate. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, I guess I'm just trying to figure out like, how do you, where do you go to find these deals other than, you know, calling people up directly and going through Google Maps, right? Uh, is it still possible for us to, you know, go to some sort of portal and find these uh, seller finance deals? Yeah, if you're not a real estate agent, you don't have access to the MLS. You can do websites like Crexy. Um, Crexy is better than LoopNet, uh, but you can find them on LoopNet. LoopNet's like the deal graveyard, so don't go there to find deals. Just go there to find brokers. Mm -hmm. But Crexy has some okay deals that you can make work. CoStar, if you want to pay for CoStar, I don't know. I know their pricing structure just changed, so it might be affordable now yeah. for individuals to just pick a market. But those are the those are the ones I'd use if I wasn't an agent. I see. Uh when you approach, so sometimes you'll find deals that say seller financing, but sometimes you just call people up saying, hey, I want to buy your property. How do you bring up the topic of seller financing with the person who's selling the uh, property that owns the property? Oh, so this is if it's on the market? Yeah, if it's on the market or even if it's not on the market, right? You found a property, you're like, I want to purchase it, but I need seller financing, right? Not everyone is going to be willing to seller finance the deal. Is there a way Correct. that you structure it or you, um, I guess, pitch it to the owner yeah. that makes it enticing for them to put potentially seller finance the deal for you? I just ask. So I'll start with on the market and then I'll chat about off the market. Because mm -hmm. off market, I don't call people to sell and I don't call to try and buy their stuff. But uh, when it's on the market, I am calling to buy. So I just ask if they'd hold the contract. Like, hey, would you be open to holding the contract? Yeah. 
And I'm talking with the agent at that point. I don't go direct to the owner because like, it's a breach of ethics, especially as an agent, but you just shouldn't do that at all if they hired someone. So I'll talk with the broker, ask if they hold a contract, they'll either say no, or I'll ask, or yes, like, those are the answers. And um, I wait. And if they say no, then I'll just say, okay, thanks. And then I'll call them back later if it doesn't sell. Yeah, yeah. And um, if it's on Craig's scene loop, that's probably not going to sell. Mm -hmm. So as far as calling direct owner, now I'm not calling from the perspective of a buyer for their asset. I'm calling with the, the mind of a student. I want to learn how they got to where they're at. So I'm trying to book that meeting in, in person. I want to build a relationship. That's all that matters to me at that point. After I've cultivated a relationship, my question is, how would you recommend I go about doing something similar? Because at this point, I learned about their goals. They learned about mine. I shared my past, where I'm going. They shared their past, where they were going or where they're still going today. And they know what I want to accomplish. So I just say, hey, how would you recommend I go about doing something similar? How, how do you think I should, like with the pieces you have, how do you think I should go about doing this? And from that, they typically just offer to sell or finance something. And I, that could be considered luck until it happened more times than I could count on my hand. I could, mm -hmm. it's just with different people. It works over and over and over again. Yeah. Because people want to help folks that are aligned on goals. Right. People will work with you based on the goals that you set and they'll buy into your story based on the, the reasons you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is a constant with every meeting I've ever had. Yeah. So uh, that, that's the reason I do the things that, the way I do it, but I don't ask owners directly to sell or finance. I just ask how they recommend I repeat what they've done. Yeah. And whatever gets you to where you're at, it's not going to get you to the next level. So I met with people that had, you know, small portfolios. 50, 60 units and hundred units and a couple hundred units. And we'll see if the Texas thing happens. He's between Texas and Cali mm -hmm. right now, but we'll see if I meet with him. He's got a couple thousand units. Yeah. Because what got me, I can't call up a person with hundred units now or even 50 units and right. say, Hey, how the heck did you build this? Right. Not sure how I would like that. That would be lying. Right. So keep looking up, but I can still learn people, uh, learn from people that only have 10. Because they built it a different way. Yeah, I, I think this kind of ties into uh, mentorship and how I keep emphasizing to people, right? That you can, the mentors that you choose in life are always going to evolve. The uh, af, like as yeah. you evolve and grow, right? The same mentor that got you from A to B may not be the mentor that'll take you from you know B to C. So you know, always looking out, be looking out for people that are doing what you want to do, right? And then f ask, yeah. you know, figure out a way to get some sort of mentorship from them uh, i think one of the other challenges you know is the down payment aspect right like sure you can get sellers to agree to seller financing but typically you still need some s amount of money for a down payment right whether it's 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent, whatever you agree to um do you have tips on how to finance that portion um is it private capital uh, you mentioned, you know, you had this private uh, lender that you worked with initially, right? For the 12 plex, you had to pitch to a bunch of folks. Um, is that how you do most of them? Where do you find these people? How do you approach them? Let's touch on that. Yeah, so the order of operations is deal debt equity, always. Mm -hmm. So the amount of debt that you can borrow, which is step two, is dependent on the deal. And whether people structure it as a private lender and you structure the debt product where you do 100% LTV, which is how I did my first 30 apartments, first three deals, two 12s and a six. You can only do 100% debt if you have great cash flow. Mm -hmm. And the only way to improve your cash flow day one is you cannot raise your uh, rent day one and you can't decrease your expenses instantly. Like it's not an instant thing. So you either borrow less money or borrow cheaper money. If you're doing 100% LTV, you can't really borrow less money. So the way you do it is you borrow cheaper money. And, um, that's really how I did it. If you don't have a high cash flowing deal, then you have to bring the third step, which is equity, which is cash. It doesn't have to be your cash, but that would be when it is the form of an equity partner. Mm -hmm. The reason that you look at doing it like that instead of debt is if you borrow money, you have to make payments. Right. If you bring in cash, if there's no dividends, there's no dividends. That's why a whole bunch of 
people that invested in syndications aren't happy right now because there's no dividends for a lot of these syndicators who did short-term debt yeah. and they had to refinance and now all their cash flow dried up. They don't get any money. If the syndicators had just borrowed the money, they'd be negative right now instead of break even. So if you think about it just holistically as building a, a business or buying real estate, if there's a ton of cash flow, you can borrow the down payment, which is what I did. I borrowed at 12%, but I borrowed a very small portion of mm. the deal at 12%. Right. Borrowed 10% of the deal and the other 90% was at 6% interest. Right. So when you, you do your order of operations, if you want to fund your down payments with no money out of pocket, the deal has to come first and you have to analyze, can this support 100% of the debt? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, how do I make sure that the first part of the debt, the big part from the seller is low enough interest rate so I could borrow an expensive down payment? Yeah. And if I still can't do that, then I have to bring in an equity partner. And that's the outlook I have when buying real estate. Okay. When you bring in an equity partner, so if I understand this correctly, you basically bring them in, they help with the down payment and they get a piece of the equity, but they don't typically get the ca uh, the cash flow or I guess you had to pay off they the would... debt first before you pay off the partner and yourself, right? So if I did an equity partner, which I've done in the past, uh, the way that I would do it is an equity partner with a buyout agreement. So if they own 20% of the deal, 50%, whatever, whatever it is, they're entitled to that percentage of cash flow when there is cash flow. Got it. However, I don't want to be partnering with people long term. So I've already executed like full circle buyouts where I had five year agreements with people and I cash them out in six months as I get the property to perform and, and can get mm -hmm. income up and stack some money. Yeah. But someone puts in a hundred grand and I have an agreement with them. It's not a promise. It's not an obligation. It's an option to buy their ownership back. So if I come into money or if I get the cash flow up on the asset and I can borrow more money against it, then I can write a check to them and cash them out. Problem is they don't want, if they put in a hundred, they don't want a hundred back. They typically mm -hmm. want like 150, 175, 200. So equity partners, they, they don't stress the cash flow as much day one because they're not a debt. They're not an obligation. Like if there's no cash flow, there's no cash flow. But it will cost me more typically later if I want to mm -hmm. get it back. Right. And uh, so that's a balancing act. Like it's a dance of mm -hmm. do I partner with someone with the idea that I have to pay them more in the future? Or can I stress the system and borrow more money today and not lose it? Right. But that's what people have to figure out in the beginning if they want to bring on a partner or if they're going to do a buyout agreement. I don't recommend people partner with a bunch of people. Some people do. I don't. Mm -hmm. Real estate's simple. People are not. But in the beginning, if you don't have anything, you pick your problems. So yeah. I've had bad partnerships that have gone really far south and like, that have cost me a lot of money. And I've had partnerships that have made a lot of money. And mm -hmm. you win some, you lose some. Right. Yeah. Um this this podcast is called Teach Me Real Estate Investing because portion of it I selfishly use to ask you for advice and teach me, you know, a piece of real estate investing. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the situation I'm in currently and get your thoughts on, you know, what I should do next, right? Uh, so I'm planning on moving to California in the next three to four months. Um, okay. Possibly as soon as I can. It'll, hopefully, you know, two, three months. Um, originally, the idea was to move to San Diego, but due to work situation, it looks like I'll most likely have to move to the L.A. area. And home prices there are extremely high. Um, I want to somewhat, like, do a house hack similar to what I'm doing here. Um, so here in Seattle, you know, I have a triplex that I'm living in, and the other two units are... Uh, short-term rental so I, I want to do something similar there but it's it's been a little tough just because cash flow is really really difficult in an expensive yeah. market so the the biggest worry I have is you know even though I want a house hack and I want to put a like go with a low down payment option because the houses are in the millions it's still going to require us to like a significant amount of capital for a down payment for me to achieve this sure. right uh, at the same time uh, my goal 
uh, for my business was to grow my portfolio. So I had made a goal for myself to purchase, like close one deal every month this year, right? So I have this deal. Uh, it's in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a Burr deal. It's a pretty good deal in my opinion where, you know, it'll take me 25 to 30K initial capital to, you know, purchase and do the rehab and everything. Um, and then at the end of it, I'll be able to refinance most of it out. Uh, but I'll still be 10 to 15K in the deal, but I'll have a property worth 145K. It'll be cash flowing like 150 to 200 k um, dollars a month. So I thought, you know, for 10 to 15 K down, um, that I can refinance, you know, out in three, three or so months, it seemed like a pretty good deal. But my biggest fear yeah. is, Hey, I need 25 to 30 K now, but I'm also trying to buy this expensive property in LA. And so money is a little tight for me, right? It's like, I'm, I'm fearful that if I put money down in that Cleveland uh, property that I won't have enough money or I won't be able to buy that property that I want in LA. Um, and this kind of ties into maybe some creative financing or maybe raising private capital. But I want to hear your thoughts on this situation that I'm in where basically I need, I have this, you know, a couple of deals going on and I need money. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts on like, what should I do in this situation? Do you have advice for me? Like, you know yeah what's what's your goal you, you mentioned your goals you know to do the fur deal and you want to buy a, a house hack but what's your actual goal i mean real estate's a vehicle right but un, until you're super wealthy nobody says oh i just want to own this property right right like the trophy assets mm -hmm. so real estate's a vehicle to get you somewhere what is somewhere for you like are you trying to get to ten thousand a month twenty thousand a month five what's what's the number yeah so the goal initially my in my mind it was twenty thousand a month because i thought hey my living expenses are about ten thousand ish a month i think i would be able to live comfortably for ten thousand a month uh and then i sure. thought i'd have extra in case you know i run into a bad situation or you know it kind of also lets me keep expanding my portfolio Though when I talked to one of the first guests I had on the podcast, their advice to me was, hey, don't think about the 20000 If you're able to live comfortably for 10000 a month, do that first and then you, know, you can quit your job and if you get your time back, you'll be able to scale your portfolio much quicker. So now in my mind, it's like, okay, maybe 10000 is enough. Maybe that's when I will be able to say, hey, I'm going to quit my job and then focus on my uh, real estate investing business. Um, so if you know, around 10000 is the goal, that's kind of what I'm working towards. Okay. Well, I'm going to work off the 20 cuz Sure. <laughs> I I don't I don't know who your first guest was, but their goals are different than yours. You said 20. So I'm going <laughs> to go with that. Quarter million dollars a year. Okay. The way you get there is you get a 4 million dollar nest egg paying you 6%. Then you're done. So forget house hacking for a minute, forget seller financing for a minute. All you have to do is figure out how do I get to a $4 million equity position paying me 6% net. Okay. That's it. Real estate functions off of returns, mm -hmm. at least the, the stuff I buy. Right. And so you're not getting a 6% return in LA. Mm -hmm. And I know that for a fact. Right. It's, unless you get really creative and you buy on your three and four cap and you borrow at two percent then yeah you could do it but uh, you're not going to get that conventionally right now okay so you got to figure out where can i earn six percent mm -hmm. and how do i multiply my equity regardless of strategy right regardless of acquisition model how do i multiply what i have right to four million dollars right and when you realize it's that simple, it's like, okay, well, what could I do? Well, if I buy an apartment building, a 10 unit building, and I buy it at market value with a 6% rate of return, you just pick a market where that's the average. Mm -hmm. If I raise rent $100 per unit, right? 10 unit, that's an extra thousand bucks a month, which is great. Right. But a thousand bucks a month, it is 12,000 a year, 6% rate of return. My expenses did not go up in that process. You divide your new 12 grand and new NOI by 0.06, which is market value. And you add 200 grand in value, 
It's your asset. Mm -hmm. So you do the math. I was like, okay, well, that's 5% of my goal. Right. So now I have a $200,000 equity position. Now, if I do that with a 20 unit, mm -hmm. that's 10% of my goal. If I could just get 20 units and I find an opportunity, I'm buying at a market value, but maybe the rents are a little low, I could raise just $100 and still stay below market. Well, in a 6% rate of return average market, on 20 units, you're adding 400000 of value. That's 10% of your goal. And so you just start looking at real estate a little differently. It becomes a real estate problem instead of a cash flow problem. It's like, okay, well, how do I get it? Mm -hmm. And this is how we've established our criteria, our being Christian in my business model. Right. Christian got into business a year and a half ago. I got started three and a half years ago. All we care about, how do we buy it? How do we never lose it? Because when we look at real estate as a whole, it's not you press a button and it's it's gone. Like you you hold it for a while right. as long as you're not flipping. So you go into these bigger deals. It's like okay, how do I buy it? Mm -hmm. Deal debt equity. Find the deal first, then worry about the debt, and then worry about the money down. Which is a little opposite of how you presented your situation. You're worried about the money right now. Right. And once you buy it, how do we never lose it? Which comes down to long term fixed rate debt and cash flow. But if you start looking at these bigger deals instead of the little bird deal, and I'm not saying that's a bad one. I haven't right. seen your deal, but you start looking at these bigger ones where you can start optimizing the real estate. You can start really multiplying your net worth. And now you just have to figure out how do I buy it and how do I never lose it? And if you can answer those two questions on the front end of the, how do you buy it as you find your deal, then you line up the debt and then you line up the down payment if you don't get hundred percent debt yeah. and then long-term fixed rate debt and cash flow. So you don't lose it. As long as you can do those basic things in your position, you just have to figure out how do I optimize the real estate to where I have $4 million equity. And at that point, if you have $4 million equity paying you 6% in a long-term fixed rate debt model, you're going to be pretty stably earning 20 grand a month in net cash flow. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Yeah. So it sounds like you're leading me towards multifamily deals rather than focusing on these single family, like one-offs your suggestion is why not just go bigger? It's going to be simpler to do the bigger model. Okay. It's not going to necessarily be easier, but it shouldn't be harder. Okay. And it's just simpler. If you have a few roofs versus many, mm -hmm. when you talk about cash flowing 100, 150, 200 bucks, like that's wonderful, but you got to do a lot of those transactions. Right. Right. I don't like to add steps. So if I were in your shoes, which is you know the question you, you were leading up to, I would look bigger because this is an equity problem right now. Equity produces cash flow and dividend producing real estate and, and rental real estate on the bigger scale. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, I just realized if I optimize stuff, mm -hmm. I can multiply my net worth and I'm going to earn dividends based on the, the net worth that someone else would pay me for an asset. Right. And that simplified it for me. So I I think if you quit the idea of just house hacking mm -hmm. and are open to it, like if it pops up and you have a great opportunity, then I'll do it. But that's not going to be the only way I get there. Right. I think if you open your mind, to, like, I'm going to just find the best deal and the, the best location I can afford to buy. And if I find a stellar opportunity to house hack, I'll do it. But if not, I'm just aiming for that $4 million equity position in a 6% rate of return average market. Right. I think you'll grow faster. Interesting. Yeah, this, this has been, uh, I guess, something I've been struggling with in my mind for a long time, right? Whether I should, you know, kind of continue with these single family homes and try to expand that way or if I should get into multifamily, right? And I guess... In my mind, it's all, always been kind of like an unknown of like, oh, my God, there's like so many units. I don't know how to operate a multifamily. I don't know how to, you know, identify those opportunities, right? I think a lot of people make money when they find a deal that's like underperforming and they can, you know, um, see that opportunity to either increase the income or decrease the expenses. Then you just get a boost in equity day one or, you know, in the first year or so. I think because of this maybe lack of knowledge, I've always been a little nervous about looking at multifamily deals. And I think that's that's what's been stopping me and wh why I've been looking at single family homes rather. Um, 
But I think what you're saying is if I simplify it, maybe focus on educating myself, maybe that is the better way to go about it. And it's scary until it isn't. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the big thing. It, you know, you, you can risk losing stuff. Right. But the risk of not getting there is worse, I would say, if you don't do it. Right. And that, that's not like uh, just, oh, you got to jump into multifamily. I, there, there's so much multifamily out there. Like nobody could ever really compete with one another. If mm -hmm. You just pick a different market. But in, in your shoes, the, the, if you're adding 10 at a time versus one at a time, odds are you'll probably get to your goal faster adding 10. Yeah. And that's just, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Cool. We do have to wrap up here. I think a lot of what we discussed today has been really helpful, especially for me. Um, for people out there who want to get started in real estate investing, do you have tips or advice for them on how to get started? Yeah. So number one, you need to map out. There's a couple things. I, I call it the circle drill. And this is something I put together a little while ago. But um, it all comes down to communication. Mm -hmm. And when you're communicating with owners or brokers or potential investors or partners, it's really important to map out three things. Number one is where you're coming from. And, and where you're coming from is relatability. People will relate with you. you. You'll get to more tables if you can relate with people. And that comes down to your ability to communicate your past experiences, mm -hmm. the, the things that you've gone through. And it's really your story. The, the second point is your goals, because it's one thing to get to the table with people, but if you can communicate what you want to go accomplish, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, if you, you communicate your goals, people will be more likely to work with you if yeah. they align with those. And then the reason why you're aiming for those, what changes for you when you hit those goals, significance is really what gets people to buy into your story. So once you map out those three things, where you're coming from, where you're going, and what changes when you get there. Your ability to communicate that is going to determine your success in this business. Mm -hmm. So if you can really just focus on your communication skills, that that's going to be, at least that's what it was for me. I was a huge introvert all through high school. Right. I had to learn to communicate, and I did it through talking with Starbucks baristas because I figured, you know, if I blow <laughs> the conversation, I'll never talk with them again. So it'd right. be okay. And I had a lot of conversations that were super awkward, but I had to learn how to communicate with people in the space and how to effectively communicate. If you can do that and really map out your story of where you're coming from, where you're going and what changes when you get there. Mm -hmm. What I found is that people who can do that are more effective storytellers and the people who are more effective at storytelling seem to get farther in this world than those who aren't. So yeah. I would just try and figure that piece out and then I'd go meet with the players in the space. When you know how to communicate, go do it. You meet with the players, learn how they became a player, repeat it. And now all of a sudden you're a player in the space. That is, that is the, this business cycle. And it's super simple. There's no more steps than that. Uh, there, there's some little minute details of the, the figuring out, okay, what is a promissory note? What's the deed of trust? How do these work? But that is the overarching idea of learn how to communicate, meet with the players, learn how they became a player, become a player. Like those are the, the simple steps. Yeah. We talked a little bit about my goals. I'm curious. I want to hear about what your goals are and what do you have planned in 2023? Yeah. So Christian and I partnered a year and a half ago. Our goal was to get to 100 units in two years. We did it in 11 months. Wow. To, to celebrate, we bought a seller finance resort. So we have a, we have a four step business cycle. You have your build phase and your build phase is you, you set out your goal. Like you talked about, you want to get to 20 grand a month. Let's go build till we get to 20 grand a month. Once you build it, you build the org, you build the systems. Time to stabilize the systems. Let's, let's stabilize the real estate. So that's what we're doing right now. Stabilization will be over by Christian's birthday on February 17th. Mm -hmm. That is the number one target we're shooting for right now. Stabilize. So that's step two of the four-step cycle. Then you go into optimization, where we optimize everything. 
we're going to optimize, um, like, and by that, I mean, optimizing the real estate and the businesses. So we're going to work on lowering our expenses. We're going to go and do mini splits. It's going to reduce our cost mm -hmm. a lot on utilities and it'll allow us to charge a little higher rent, which is going to, the net value add to the portfolio will be about two and a half million dollars from that. Wow. So we're working on that next. That's also going to lower our loan to values. Once we've optimized it, and that's going to be this year, we're just focusing on optimizing. We'll buy a couple, couple properties. Then we go into what's called debt hammer and we're not there yet, but that's where we pay off all the debt. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to build phase, except for we only build with non-recourse debt. So it doesn't tank all the stuff we own outright. Yeah. So right now our sole objective is to stabilize. And after February 17th, which is Christian's birthday, that was just the target. Like we're pushing really hard for that. Then we're going to go into the optimization and that's going to be this year. So we're going to try and optimize the real estate, try and cut expenses, try and maximize the stability of the portfolio. So mm -hmm. get long-term leases, great tenants. Um, we're doing some projects right now that'll minimize like we're you know, insulation, new roofs, all this stuff, um, stabilize portfolio for the long term. And then after this year, we're going to knock out all the debt. Mm -hmm. And that should take about four years after this year to knock it all out. And that's the goal. But um, we're just in the stabilization part of our cycle. So still very early yeah. in the journey. When you say take out all the debt, do you mean just the high interest portion? Like uh, Pay it all off. Like 100% own all the properties? Pay it all off. And when it's all paid in cash, and this is, some people say I'm stupid for that, and that's fine. Uh, I, uh, I'm just going to pay it off. I'm going to Dave Ramsey this stuff. <laughs> the difference is when my stuff is paid off, I'm going to go build phase again, and I'm not going to build in cash, but I'm going to go build a bigger portfolio with non-recourse debt so it does not um, wreck what I've built. Right. I'll have the net worth to go get agency debt. I, I can already get agency loans. We're, we're working on that on one of our deals. We're going to try and do that later this year, but um, that's a non-recourse debt product, so the collateral is the subject asset that the underlying debt is on. So. Mm -hmm. We'll go build again, but that won't wreck what we've paid off in cash. Wow. So that's what we're working on. But I, I have a saying, you're not there yet. Don't worry about it. I'm not there yet, so don't worry about it. That's future Cody's problem. Right. But we, we will relever, but it'll only be non-recourse debt. Got it. And a lot of the seller finance loans that we do are non-recourse, and we're looking at some big seller finance plays. So if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But that is... If we just pay off where we're at, we're good. Mm -hmm. We already hit the original goal. Yeah. And that's what I'm recommending to you. Hit the original goal, then stabilize, optimize, pay off. Okay. Sounds good. For folks that want to follow your journey or they want to reach out to you, what's the best way of doing that? Yeah. So they can reach out to me on Instagram at doing Cody things. I have a shirt that says I'm Cody doing Cody things. <laughs> so Instagram one way. If they want to follow the journey on YouTube, we post a lot more there. It's Cody and Christian Multifamily Strategy. Awesome. And if folks want to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube at I so got this. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk with us today, Cody. I, I learned a lot. I hope our audience does as well. Uh, and I wish you the best in 2023. I'm excited to follow your journey. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, that is the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. It would really help my mission of teaching more people about real estate investing. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>